because deep in my heart I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Lift every voice and sing till the I see you, refulgent ones, burning so steadily like big white arc lights. There are so many of you. I like to watch you weaving all together and with precision, each his ray, your tracery of light, making a shining way about America. I note your infinite reactions in glassware and sequin and puddles and bits of jet and here and there a diamond. But you do not yet see me, who am a torch blown along the wind, flickering to a spark, but never out. Welcome to Claiming Our Rights, Voices from the Movement for Women's Suffrage. We're so grateful you decided to join us. My name is Christina Wong and I will be your host this evening. 2020, there's a lot of things, but it also marked one century since the ratification of the 19th Amendment in which the right to vote was given to all citizens regardless of sex. Now with the circumstances of the past year, many of us postponed our celebrations and moments of recognition, but Tonight, on this eve of International Women's Day, we reflect on this achievement while acknowledging the ways in which this victory came short of full justice. Despite the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Jim Crow laws in the South prevented Black Americans from exercising their right to vote for decades. As the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act gave Native Americans full citizenship, but states set up laws to disenfranchise them across the country. Many Asian Americans were denied citizenship and the rights and protections it provides until 1952. And today, our laws and election processes still disenfranchise many. As said by Celise Henderson in her song, Freedom, which played in our opening video, we see how some things are changing and how some things are not. We open tonight's event with Emily Rose Ridge, known more commonly as Lola. Born in Ireland in 1873, she arrived in New York City in 1908 and immersed herself in the city's teeming communities of artists, writers, feminists, and radicals. Ridge became active in some of the most significant struggles of the day. Her passion for the movements around gender as well as race, ethnicity, and class informed her work as a magazine editor, writer, and lecturer. We thank Amber Tamblin for giving voice to Lola Ridge's poetry. As we move through tonight's program, we aim to celebrate those who fought disenfranchisement and brought us one step closer to the realization of full access to the vote. We also honor the thousands whose contributions have never been given the recognition they deserve. In New York, the fight for political equality was elevated by the work and words of Sojourner Truth. Born in 1797, she survived her first 30 years in the South, enslaved and enduring cruel violence and forced labor. She escaped to New York with her daughter a year before the state adopted a law to free slaves and became an outspoken advocate for abolition, civil rights, and women's rights. As part of this work, Sojourner Truth gave lectures across the country, raising awareness about the need for women of color to be treated as equals within the suffrage movement and as equals with men. Having lived 30 years without freedom, she devoted her next 60 years to securing freedom and equality for all. Please welcome 
Tracy Toms, as she brings us the stirring words of Sojourner Truth in her address to the first annual meeting of the American Equal Rights Association. My friends, I am rejoiced that you are glad, but I don't know how you will feel when I get through. I come from another field, the country of the slave. They have got their liberty. So much good luck to have slavery partly destroyed. Not entirely. I want it root and branch destroyed. Then we will all be free indeed. I feel that if I have to answer for the deeds done in my body just as much as man, I have a right to have as much as a man. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored woman. I want women to have their rights. In the courts, women have no right, no voice, nobody speaks for them. I wish woman to have her voice there among the pettifoggers. If it is not a fit place for women, it is unfit for men to be there. I am above 80 years old. It is about time for me to be going. I have been 40 years a slave and 40 years free and will be here 40 years more to have equal rights for all. I suppose I'm kept here because something remains for me to do. I suppose I am yet to help to break the chain. I have done a great deal of work as much as a man but did not get so much pay. We do as much, eat as much, we want as much. I suppose I'm about the only colored woman who goes about to speak for the rights of the colored women. I want to keep the thing stirring now that the ice is cracked. And what we want is a little money. <laughs> You men know that you get as much again as women when you write or for what you do. It is a good consolation to know that when we've got this battle once fought, we shall not be coming to you anymore. You have been having our rights so long that you think, like a slaveholder, that you own us. I know that it is hard for one who has held the reins for so long to give up. It cuts like a knife. But it will feel all the better when it closes up again. And I have been in Washington about three years seeing about these colored people. Now colored men have the right to vote. There ought to be equal rights now more than ever since colored people have got their freedom. I am going to talk several times while I'm here. So now I will do a little singing. I have not heard any singing since I came here. Welcome Carol C. of Cise, singing her original song, Biscocho Amago, which means bitter cake in Spanish, about women feeling empowered, standing up for themselves, and demanding their libertad. Algo que no está bien. No, 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 no
sé que tengo la razón Ya de esto hace mucho Y quizás con el tiempo Seremos amigos Porque tonta no lo soy Y el bizcocho que era dulce Ya me usa Ve amargo Eso que pasa Abolitionist, orator, publisher, writer, and statesman Frederick Douglass used his own experience of enslavement to argue for the rights of all people. In his autobiography, he recounts a conversation with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and speaks to why he believes everyone should have a voice in governance. We are pleased to be joined by Ryan Jamal Swain lending his voice to Douglass's words. Observing women's agency, devotion, and efficiency in the pleading of the cause of the slave, gratitude for this high service early moved me to give favorable attention to the subject of what is called women's rights <laughs> and caused me to be denominated as a women's rights man. Now, I am glad to say that I have never been ashamed to be thus designated. You know, if, if intelligence is the only true and rational basis of government, it follows that that is the best government which draws its life and power from the largest sources of wisdom, energy, and goodness at its command. Now, the force of this record reasoning would be easily comprehended and readily assented to in any case involving the employment of physical strength. Now we should all see the folly and madness of attempting to accomplish what with a part, what can only be achieved with the united strength of the whole. Though his folly may be less apparent, it is just as real when one half of the moral and intellectual power of the world is excluded from any voice or vote in civil government. In this denial, of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. <clears throat> Thus far, all human rights governments have failed. I mean, for none have secured, except in partial degree, the ends for which governments are instituted, war, slavery, injustice, and oppression, and the idea that might makes right have been uppermost in all such governments. And the weak, for whose protection governments are ostensibly created, have had practically no rights which the strong have felt bound to respect. Seeing that the male governments of the world have failed, it can do no harm to Try the experiment of a government by man and woman united. 
But you know, it is not my purpose to argue the question here, but simply to state in a brief way the ground of my espousal of the cause of women's suffrage. I believe that the exclusion of my race from participation in government was not only wrong, but a great mistake because it took from the, that race motives for high thought and endeavor and degraded them into the eyes of the world around them. Man derives a sense of his consequences in the world, not merely subjectively, but objectively. You know, if from the cradle through life, the outside world brands a class unfit for this or that work, the character of that class will come to resemble and conform to the character described. You know, to find valuable qualities in our fellows, such qualities must, must be presumed and expected. Now, I would give a woman a vote, give her a motive to qualify herself to vote, precisely as I insisted upon the giving the, word, the colored man the right to vote, in order that she shall have the same motive for making herself a useful citizen as those enforced in the case of other citizens. In a word, I have never yet been able to find one consideration, one argument or suggestion in favor of man's rights to participate in civil government, which did not equally apply to the right of women. Many poems printed in colonial American newspapers and pamphlets testified to women's political protests of their subordinate status. Performed today by Taya Leone, this anonymous poem was first printed in Virginia in 1736 and reprinted in South Carolina in 1743. Custom, alas, doth partial prove, nor gives us even measure. To maids it is a pain to love, but tis to men a pleasure. They freely can their thoughts explain, whilst ours must burn within. We have got eyes and tongues in vain, and truth from us is sin. Men to new joys and conquests fly, and yet no hazard run. Poor we are left if we deny, or if we yield undone. Then equal laws let custom find, nor either sex oppress. More freedom give to womankind, or give to mankind less. 140 years after that poem first appeared in a newspaper, Lakota writer, musician, and activist for Native American rights, Zikala Shah, also known as Gertrude Simmons Bonin, was born in 1876. She was taken from her home on the Yankton Reservation by South Dakota missionaries when she was eight years old. As a young woman, she taught at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania before choosing to move back out west and become an activist for indigenous populations. In 1926, Zakala Shah founded the National Council of American Indians. This council worked to unite U.S. tribes behind the full cause of citizenship and voting rights. She would serve as its president until her death in 1938, fighting for civil rights, access to health care, and education for all Native Americans. Delena Studi joins us tonight to share her words. The greatest gift in life is consciousness. Not positions, not the dollar, but that the Almighty Spirit gives us life and we have a rational mind with which to see all the wonders of the universe. And this is true, my brothers and sisters. Consciousness, above all else, that is the way it should be. Let us cling to that. Let us do the practical way. We have had to change from the old styles of hunting, have had to leave the old trails. We have got to learn the new trails. We can do it. We have the power. We can think. We can be fair. Work is honorable as long as men and women are honest. There is no work that is degrading. It is all honorable. The new trails we are hunting. 
We have come from our homes to this national teepee, and we are talking with one another in a different language. But we are all proud of our Indian blood. We are glad we are Indians. We want our children to be proud of their Indian blood. There is so much good in our people. Everyone knows that when we give our word, we keep it. Let us save those wonderful things, the virtues of our race, their honesty, clean living, and intelligence. Let us teach our children that their Indian blood stands for the virtues of their race. Now we are meeting a civilization from a race that came from Europe. We have to meet it each day. There is no dodging, and it is not easy. It is going to take courage. It is going to test your strength. It is going to test your faith in the greatest of all. It is going to be hard. But let us stand the test, true to the Indian blood. Let us do that. Let us teach our children to be proud of their Indian blood and to stand the test bravely. We have been told organization is necessary to bring about results. We have been scattered to the four winds. Are we going to organize? This is a national teepee. We are all coming together here to consult together. And from these various ideas, we want to come to a conclusion. Is that any different from other meetings of American people? All other peoples do the same. They came together. I have been in sessions of Congress when the great men there met together. They will discuss their subjects, some on one side, some on another, both giving soundest arguments. Was it treason for these men to have difference of opinion? It was not treason against the government. They were representing their people. They were representing the government, but they had different views, and they had the privilege of speaking. Now, I am sure in our humble gathering here, we have that same liberty. We are in America, and we have, each one of us, a right to express our views. And to do this, we must have organization. The work of the society has been grinding and constant, early and late. Do you think anyone would work, devote himself entirely to a cause without a salary, if he did not believe in it? Then you know we must all work for this thing. That the American Indian must have a voice. Wado, thank you. While the 19th Amendment extended the vote to women in 1920, Voter suppression tactics meant that the rights black suffrages fought for were, in practice, inaccessible. Born in Montgomery County, Mississippi in 1917, Fannie Lou Hamer was, like many African Americans living in the Jim Crow South, unaware that black people could register and vote. In 1962, at the age of 44, she attended a meeting held by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that inspired her to dedicate herself to ensuring equal access to the ballot. This televised speech, in which she helped challenge the all-white Mississippi delegation to the 1964 Democratic National Convention, is regarded as having changed the course of Black voting rights in America. Here, Margaret Odette recounts Hamer's brutal experience of state-sanctioned violence during voter registration. These words shook the nation to its core, as they should today. Mr. Chairman, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer and I live in Mississippi. It was in August 1962 that 18 of us traveled to try to register to become first class citizens. We was met by highway patrolmen and they only allowed two of us to take the literacy test. The bus driver was charged with driving a bus the wrong color. After we paid the fine, we continued to where I had worked as a timekeeper and sharecropper for 18 years. I was met by my children who told me the plantation owner was angry 
because I had tried to register. My husband came and said the plantation owner was raising cane. And the plantation owner came and said, Fannie Lou, do you know, did Pat tell you what I said? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I mean that. If you don't go down and withdraw your registration, you will have to leave because we're not ready for that in Mississippi. I said, I didn't try to register for you. I tried to register for myself. I had to leave that same night. In September, 16 bullets were fired into the Tucker home for me. That same night, two girls were shot in Ruleville. McDonald's house was shot in. In June 1963, I attended a voter registration workshop. When we got to Winona, Mississippi, four got off the bus to use the washroom and two, the people, the restaurant. The four was ordered out. I rushed to see what happened. One of the ladies said, it was a state highway patrolman and a chief of police ordered us out. I saw when they began to get the five people in a highway patrolman's car, I stepped off and somebody screamed, get that one there. The man told me I was under arrest. He kicked me. I was carried to the county jail and placed in a cell to hear the sounds of licks and, and horrible screams. And I could hear somebody say, can you say yes, sir, nigga? Can you say yes, sir? And other horrible names. They beat her. I don't know how long. And she began to pray and ask God to have mercy on those people. Three white men came to my cell. A patrolman asked me where I was from, and I told him. He said, ha <laughs> we're going to check on this. They came back. He said, oh, you are from Ruleville, all right. He used a cursed word and said, we're gonna make you wish you was dead. I was carried into another cell where they had two Negro prisoners. The patrolman ordered the first Negro to take the blackjack. The first Negro prisoner was ordered to order me to lay down on my face. And I laid down on my face. The first Negro began to beat me until he was exhausted. I was holding my hands behind me at that time because I suffered from polio when I was six years old. The patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. He began to beat and I began to work my feet. And the patrolman ordered the first Negro to sit on my feet. I began to scream and one white man began to, to beat me in my head. One white man, my dress had worked up high. He walked over and pulled my dress. I pulled my dress down and he pulled my dress back up. I was in jail when Medgar Evers was murdered. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America? The land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives are being threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you. Here is Grammy-nominated Emily King performing her original song, Sides, written in tribute to those who help us get through hardships and give us the strength we need to conquer our biggest challenges. After the light has gone away And the monster 
houses start to creep I'll never fear the closet Born into slavery in Mississippi in 1862, Ida B. Wells Barnett was a prolific investigative journalist and suffragist who campaigned tirelessly for anti-lynching legislation. In 1884, 70 years before Rosa Parks, she refused to give up her train car seat, which led to a successful lawsuit against the train company. Wells Barnett refused to let the structural inequality in the U.S. go undocumented, and all women today are indebted to her bravery. In this piece, performed by Alexis Floyd, How Enfranchisement Stops Lynching, Wells Barnett illuminates how the right to vote protects the right to life itself. The flower of the 19th century civilization for the American people was the abolition of slavery and the enfranchisement of all manhood. Here at last was the squaring of practice with percept, with true democracy, with the declaration of independence and with the golden rule. The reproach and disgrace of the 20th century is that the whole of the American people have permitted a part to nullify this glorious achievement and make the 14th and 15th amendments to the Constitution playthings, a mockery and a byword, an absolute dead letter in the Constitution of the United States. One third of the states of the Union have made and enforced laws which abridge the rights of American citizens. Although the Constitution specifically says no state shall do so, they do deprive persons of life, liberty, and property without 
due process of law and do deny equal protection of the laws to persons of Negro descent. The rights of citizens to vote is denied and abridged in these states on account of race, color, and previous conditions of servitude and has been so denied ever since the withdrawal of the United States troops from the South. This in spite of the 15th Amendment, which declares no state shall do this. These rights were denied first by violence and bloodshed, by Ku Klux Klans, who during the first years after the Civil War murdered Negroes by wholesale, for attempting to exercise the rights given by these amendments and for trusting the government, which was powerful enough to give them the ballot, to be strong enough to protect them in its exercise. Senator Tillman told how it was done in a speech on the floor of the United States Senate when he said, that he and the people of South Carolina shot Negroes to death to keep them from voting. This they did till congressional investigation of the Ku Klux methods turned the limelight on the unspeakable barbarism of those wholesale murders. The South changed its tactics after that investigation, but never once let up on its aim to nullify and finally abrogate these amendments and rob the Negro of the only protection to his citizenship, his ballot. Again, we have the testimony of the United States Senator on the floor of the Senate as to how this was further done when Senator Tillman defiantly told how he and his compatriots stuffed ballot boxes and threw out those of that remnant of the Black South, which still tried to register its gratitude at the polls. When this bewildered race turned in dazed appeal to the government, which gave its freedom and the ballot, awaiting explanation and beseeching protection, it was told that the government has made a mistake in enfranchising them, that it had offended the South by doing so and was now busy repealing the Civil Rights Bill, affirming Jim Crow legislation, upholding disenfranchising state constitutions and removing every way possible the Constitution guarantees life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Removing everything, in fact, which was offensive to those who had fired on the flag and tried to break up the Union. And the Negro must now look out for himself. This he has done for the past 30 years as best he could. He was advised that if he gave up trying to vote, minded his own business, acquired property, and educated his children, he could get along in the South without molestation. But the more lands and houses he acquired, the more rapidly discriminating laws have been passed against him by those who control the ballot, and less protection is given by the lawmakers for his life, liberty, and property. The Negro has been given separate and inferior schools because he has no ballot. He therefore cannot protest against such legislation by choosing other lawmakers or retiring to private life those who legislate against his interests. The more he sends his children to school, the more restrictions are placed on Negro education. And he has absolutely no voice in the disposition of the school funds his taxes help to supply. His only weapon of defense has been taken from him 
by legal enactment in all of the old Confederacy. And the United States government, a consenting Saul, stands by holding the clothes of those who stone and burn him to death, literally and politically. With no sacredness of the ballot, there can be no sacredness of human life itself. For if the strong can take the weak man's ballot when it suits his purposes to do so, he will take his life also. Eminent poet, author, and lecturer Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was born in 1825 in Baltimore. She was the first black woman to publish a short story and was an influential abolitionist, suffragist, and reformer. Harper urged suffragists to act in solidarity with the struggles of African Americans and support the 15th Amendment. Her critiques of the white supremacy found within the women's suffrage movement informed black feminism and intersectionality in her time and beyond. This poem, titled Aunt Chloe's Politics, is performed tonight by Stacey Ann Chin. Of course, I don't know much about these politics, but I think that some who run them do mighty ugly tricks. I've seen them honey fugue around and talk so awful sweet that you'd think them full of kindness as an egg is full of meat. Now, I don't believe in looking honest people in the face and saying when you're doing wrong that I haven't sold my race. When we want to school our children, if the money isn't there, whether black or white have took it, the loss we all must share. And this buying up each other is something worse than mean, though I think's a heap of voting I go for voting clean. In the 1830s, women around the nation intensified conversations around social and religious norms, knowledge of laws, property ownership, civic participation, and other avenues to autonomy, including the vote. The first women's convention took place in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. It drew individuals holding many identities, civil rights activists, abolitionists, people of faith, mothers, friends. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a writer and tireless advocate for women's rights, drafted a Declaration of Sentiments modeled after the United States Declaration of Independence to highlight the work and shift in perspective needed to secure equality for women. Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Harriet Cady Eaton, and 97 other activists signed the Declaration and its related resolutions calling for an expansion of women's role and rights in American society. The most controversial resolution called for securing women's right to vote. Its inclusion caused some advocates to back away from signing the Declaration, but it became a critical piece of the movement for women's rights. To bring to life this collaborative work, please welcome members of the Resistance Revival Chorus and leaders from the original Women's March, Ginny Suss, Sarah Sophie Flicker, and Brooke Williams. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right 
of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experiences have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they were accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of women under this government. And now, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. Having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Now, in view of this entire disenfranchisement of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. In entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule, but we shall use every instrumentality within our power to effect our object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press in our behalf. We hope this, we hope this convention will be followed by a series of conventions embracing every part of this country. The 2018 midterm election landed a record number of women in the halls of Congress. In advance of the 2020 election, legions of volunteers labored to ensure voter turnout and access to the ballot. A group of eight women joined together to write this next piece of music, debuting at CBS's Get Out the Vote event. Originally performed by Alicia Keys and Brandi Carlisle, Issa Bruder brings this piece to us tonight. Started out as a whisper, it turned into a scream, made a beautiful noise. Shoulder to shoulder, marching in the street. When you're all alone, it's a quiet breeze. But when you band together, it's a choir of fire and rain. Now we have a choice, cause I have a voice. I'm not living or die. Don't stand in a wasteland, look me in the eye Stop living a lie, and stand up next to me You've gotta put one foot in front of the other With a hand in a hand, holding on to each other Go on and rejoice, cause you have a voice It is loud, it is clear, it's stronger than your 
Of my sisters to the violence of my brothers We can, we can rage against the river Feel the pain of another I have a voice I have a voice And I let it speak for the ones that aren't yet really free It's killing me No one's saying what we need to hear I will not let silence win When I see the pain our people are no other choice Cause I have a voice It is loud, it is clear It's stronger than your fear It's believing you belong It's calling out the wrong From the mouths of our mothers to the lips of our daughters We can, we can dream Like our brothers speaking loud for our fathers We can a voice started out as a whisper turned into a scream made a beautiful noise shoulder to shoulder marching in the street when you're alone it's a quiet breeze but when you band together it's a choir of thunder and rain now we have a choice cause i have a voice now we have a choice Cause I have a voice And now we have a choice Cause I have a voice To close out our evening, we present the words of Mabel Pingwa Lee a suffragette overlooked for many years, but whose importance is now widely recognized. Born in China in 1896, she moved to New York City as a child, and at the age of 16, was already a recognized suffragist and activist. Riding a horse up Fifth Avenue, Mabel Pingwa Lee led close to 10,000 people in the New York suffrage parade. Tonight, Stephanie Shu brings us Lee's strong and passionate speech as inspiration to continue fighting for those still disenfranchised. No matter where we go, we cannot escape hearing about woman suffrage. Yet there is hardly a question more misunderstood or that has more misapplications. The idea of women's suffrage at first stood for something abnormal, strange, and extraordinary, and so has finally become the word for anything ridiculous. The idea that women should ever wish to have or be anything more than their primitive mothers appears at first thought to be indeed tragic enough to be comic. But if we sit down and really think it over, throwing aside all sentimentalism. We find that it is nothing more than a wider application of our ideas of justice and equality. We all believe in the idea of democracy. Women's suffrage or the feminist movement is the application of democracy to women. The fundamental principle of democracy is equality of opportunity, as distinguished from equality of compensation. It means an equal chance for every man to show what his merits are. To my mind, I conceive it as fourfold. For example, having four stages to its development, like four waves, one rolling into another. They are, first, moral, religious, or spiritual, second, legal, third, political, and fourth, economic. There are great documents giving proof of these stages in the development of democracy. 
For the spiritual, we have the Sermon on the Mount. For the legal, the Magna Carta or Bill of Rights. For the political, mainly the United States Declaration of Independence. For the economic, the Communist Manifesto by Engels and Marx. In the application of democracy for women, the political is the most immediately pressing demand and is the most conspicuous because it is in the forefront. The spiritual or cultural, the movement for freedom of women to any kind of spiritual self-expression, for freedom from conventionalities, to dress as she likes and to study what she likes, may not seem the most important now, but it will be in the end. Undoubtedly, the economic is the most basic because without it, we cannot have the spiritual. The history of this economic phase divides itself into three stages or conceptions. First, there is the old conception that women, single or married, should remain at home. Then there comes the industrial revolution, taking the industry out of the home and consequently taking the woman out with it. In order to meet this new condition, there next arises a second conception that women must choose from the two prerogatives of either getting married or going out to business. And that as soon as a woman gets married, she must leave her profession and stay at home. The second conception is the one we are living under. But there is a third conception on its way, which says that women, whether married or not, should have economic freedom. If war is one of the worst things for any race, because the bravest are drained off and killed while the cowards are left to be the fathers of the coming generation, we may say that for the interest of eugenics, women should not be forced to choose between marriage and profession because then the able professional woman will lead a life of celibacy while the other is left for the mother of the race. Secondly, since the Industrial Revolution, less and less of occupation is being felt in the home for the mind and body of women. The kindergarten has gone out of the home, industry has gone out with the incoming of the age of machinery, and the care of children is being more and more recognized as a matter for experts. For example, just because she is the mother doesn't any longer mean that she is most capable to arrange her child's diet, discipline, etc. Thus, one half of the people is left almost idle. And the increasing cost of living is due to the fact that women of the higher and middle classes are becoming parasites. Furthermore, in the present condition of things, woman is distinctly inferior to man intellectually. This is caused by the lack of having their minds trained in some profession. If man had no systematized work and went idly about the house except for petty chores, he too would be intellectually inferior. The ideal marriage state is a life of comradeship. But there can be no real comradeship unless the two parties are intellectually congenial. And this can only result from giving professions to women. Under the old system, after the marriage, the man continues to develop mentally while the woman stands still. And the result is that after two or three years, the husband feels the lack of companionship at home and rushes to his club or other congenial society at every opportunity. His wife has lost her interest and knowledge of his outside world and has ceased to be his intellectual comrade. And although it must be admitted that a child loses something and not having the mother beside it to supply all its physical needs, Nevertheless, this is overbalanced by having mothers who are intellectual companions. After all, the real need and beauty of maternal affection consists in being always at hand for sympathy and confidence and not in the performance of petty chores. Besides, 
if a mother has some intellectual interest to occupy her for part of the day, she is much fresher to take care of her children than if she stays in the house and is nagged by them the whole day long. The position of women is in an unwholesome transitional stage at present in the Western countries. The building up of Western civilization has, as it were, left every other beam loose in its construction by leaving out its women. And now, there naturally has to be a time of difficult and careful readjustment before the structure can be made solid. And with that, we send you off to find the other loose beams and the structure of our democracy. We know there's a great deal of work still to be done in order to make sure that every voice will be heard. We continue to fight for the undocumented, the currently and formerly incarcerated, and for voter laws that will protect access to the polls. We thank the many who persevered for hundreds of years to pass the 19th Amendment, who stood in solidarity with all oppressed people and who continue the noble struggle for equality, dignity, and freedom. Thank you for joining us tonight for this tribute. Please sing along with Krista Detour, joined by Jess Ka and members of the 100th Hill Chorus as they sing their version of the famed The Battle Hymn of Women Anthem. Together, we share our gratitude for the voices who brought us this program tonight. Good night, be safe, be well, and if you can, be sure to vote. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the flame of women's rage Kept smoldering for centuries, now burning in this age We demand the right to vote and we demand a working wage That's why we're marching on Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you For women's time has come We have broken through the barriers We sing a battle song We will vote for liberation And we're many thousand strong We'll build a new society We've waited much too long That's why we're marching on Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over